Uh, welcome to the Creative Finance and Sub 2 webinar today for REI USA. My name is William Tingle. I'm your instructor on all things Creative Finance uh, and Subject 2 here. Uh, today, we are going to do a uh, Q&A session and answer some of the most frequently asked questions about Subject 2 and Creative Finance. So if you have any questions, uh, just drop those things uh, in the chat and we'll come back and get to those as we move along. So uh, let's, let's get started. So uh, we're just going to start with some frequently asked questions about sub two, how it works, what it is, and those type of things. So uh, of course, the most common question that we get from new investors is what is buying subject to and how does it work? Uh, really, pretty simply, when you buy a property subject to, you're purchasing it subject to the existing finances, uh, any liens or judgments that are against the property. Uh, you're buying it subject to all of those things. Now, of course, uh, we try to either discount liens or in some cases, uh, just basically ignore them. Uh, and depending on your state statute, uh, different amounts of time, they will just go away. In most cases, a lot of liens aren't renewed. Uh, they just disappear. They're only valid for a certain period of time. But you're really uh, just taking over the payments in a lot of cases. Most of the houses that you're going to buy uh, will not have any liens or judgments. They will just have a mortgage or possibly two mortgages and you're gonna take over the payments on those. So, but it is important to remember that when you're buying property subject to, you are buying it subject to any uh, title defects, liens or judgments or mortgages that are on the property. You're agreeing to take the house and take on uh, the responsibility of either satisfying all of those liens, paying them off at some point or just waiting them out, okay? So uh, the second question that uh, we get commonly is if the seller deeds you the property and remains liable for the debt, uh, that sounds kind of crazy. Why in the world would anybody do that? And I'll tell you, uh, you just never really know. Uh, sometimes people get into situations and the house or the debt or any Anything else in their life really uh, becomes not quite as important. Job loss or death in the family, uh, a divorce, uh, something that caused them not to be able to make the payment, something much bigger in their life uh, can cause these things to happen. Uh, you know, really uh, the best example of, of how to understand that, uh, that I can give you uh, is what, you know, what people say about you, I mean, Let's just take uh, somebody that does something horrible, uh, a mass murder or anything like that. And, you know, people say, how could somebody do something like that? Well, unless you can put yourself in the mind of that individual or what they've got going on, you really just don't know until you've had a divorce that was a difficult time. You can't understand why anybody would just give away their house and still remain liable on the note or until you've had the death of, of your spouse or, or something just horrible happened to you like that. You really can't understand why. But situations like that make owning a house or being responsible for that debt just not that important anymore. So uh, for those reasons, people may decide to just eat it away to you. Uh, or another really common question that we get is, isn't buying subject to illegal? What about the due on sale clause? Well, the first thing you need to know is the due on sale clause is a contract agreement. Uh, it's a contractual obligation between uh, the seller and the bank. There's, there, there's no law involved in any of that. It's just, it's just a contract. It's just an agreement that they have. And that agreement says that the uh, new homeowner will not do anything to transfer any interest in that property to any other person without the bank's approval. Uh, that's not a law. It's just an agreement. So can they violate that without any penalty? Well, sure they can. Now, there are possible consequences for that. The bank could, in fact, call the loan due. Does that ever happen? Uh, very, very rarely. In fact, uh, the, about the only two things that would cause that to happen is if the payments start being made on time or if you don't handle insurance properly. Those are the two biggest causes that I've seen in the last 22 years of investing. 
uh, for causing there to be some type of problem with a due on sale clause. In fact, there's no law that says you can't buy property subject to. We certainly, even today, with all the other craziness that goes on, we have the right to buy and sell. And if you own property, you certainly have the right to sell it. Now, again, the due on sale clause is an agreement between the homeowner and uh, the bank that they won't transfer an interest. But can you do it anyway? Well, absolutely you can. There's no law against it. There's no due on sale jail. So don't worry about those things. In fact, uh, the Gar St. Germain Act uh, gives a few exceptions or exemptions for transfer of interest, such as transferring title into a land trust for estate planning purposes. And a lot of investors that I know, including myself, we utilize this loophole uh, to try to help us avoid the due on sale clause. So um, does it work? Well, I've been, like I said, I've been doing it for 22 years. And I've never had a loan call due yet. Can it happen? Sure it can. And you need to know uh, of that possibility and, and make sure that you have a plan in place for that should it happen. Um, another question that we get uh, commonly is, hey, I've heard that if I buy this way, I'm not liable for the loan. If I can't make the payments, I can just give the house back and just kind of walk away from it. Well, you know, I've heard that a lot too. And a lot of, of you know, significant teachers, uh, people that are very well known uh, say this, you know, you're technically, you're not responsible for the loan. Can you walk away from it? Well, sure you can, if you want to. Now, is that the right thing to do? No, I, I don't go along uh, with that, uh, that agree, you know, that, that statement that you don't have to do it. In fact, you know, if you've made the promise to the seller, you've taken title to the property, you've started making the payments, you may not be legal, um, legally responsible, but certainly from a moral standpoint, you've, you've made that promise uh, and you should go through with it. If you can't do it, then you need to sell that property or find another investor who can buy it uh, and take care of it that way. You certainly don't ever uh, need to think that you can just let it go back or let it go to foreclosure or anything like that. That's, that's definitely not a good way to run your business. I don't think you should do that. Uh, another question that we get commonly is I have heard that subject to is a good way to get started without cash or credit. Would you recommend this? Absolutely. You can buy houses without having a lot of money, uh, certainly without having credit. Uh, but I would not recommend buying houses subject to until you at least have access to funds to make payments in case your tenant or your buyer doesn't come through. But we sell houses that we buy with seller financing. And because of that, we collect a down payment on that property. Say, for example, we have a house that we're selling for $200,000. We're going to be looking for a down payment somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen to 20000 and you want to put a good portion of that in the bank just for whatever. If your buyer doesn't make the payments on time, you're still responsible for that underlying mortgage. So you want to make sure that that gets done. So I would recommend that even though you can buy in a lot of cases without cash or credit, you should absolutely uh, have the money in the bank to take care of those. So uh, if anyone has any questions, just put those in the uh, chat box. And we'll get to those. In the meantime, I'm just going to read a few more uh, questions and answers that we commonly get um, from uh, students from time to time. Uh, another question that we get is about deal structure. Uh, how do you structure a sub two deal? Well, first, let me say that when you talk about deal structure, you can be talking about a lot of different scenarios. Deal structure uh, can mean a step-by-step -step on how you put a deal together. Uh, and this could mean from the time you pick up the phone when the seller calls you to what contracts are best to use, how to handle insurance or maybe taxes, uh, how best to deal with the bank to get information. Uh, do you need to use a title company or close it yourself? Right down to the handling and in uh, negotiations with the seller. You know, deal structure can also mean evaluating uh, the numbers of the actual property itself, things like location, maybe condition, number of bedrooms and bathrooms uh, to make a decision on how or even if 
this property can be utilized in your overall investment strategy. Uh, for example, uh, if interest rate is too high to make sense for cash flow, but the property has good equity, uh, maybe it would be uh, in your best interest to just get the deed and retail it or flip it. Uh, my wife, uh, Jody, her first deal was, uh, was a really good sub two. The property was in great shape. It needed minor repairs. But uh, because the payments were too high to really cash flow with seller financing, uh, she just listed it with an agent and flipped it and made a nice profit. So, you know, sub twos don't always have to be no equity. Uh, sometimes they can uh, they can have equity but have a bad payment. Hey, in the best case scenario, they would actually have equity and have a good payment for you as well. But that doesn't always happen. And in those cases, uh, you may either have to decide to flip it or if it has no equity, sell it with seller financing. Now, we typically make between fifty and sixty thousand dollars on an average deal on a house with no equity, and I've given several examples of that in the in the past. But uh, a house with, with in good condition with no equity, if it's got a great interest rate loan on it in the two to three percent range, uh, you can make a lot of money with those because of the interest spread and the markup that you get on those houses. Uh, for the purposes of this question today, though. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to evaluate where a deal is something that you'd want to keep uh, or flip it or how you would want to do that. Uh, to, to understand structure, of course, first, you're going to want to understand the basics of subject to, you know, when you're taking over a property that has a mortgage on it uh, and that sort of thing. Now, if you're like me, uh, your plan will most likely be to go out, find someone to buy that property from you with seller financing. They'll give you a down payment, make payments to you every month. At some point, uh, we like a three-year plan, and that means that we try to set our buyers up to cash us out in three years. Uh, they'll refinance us at that time. We'll pay off the seller's original loan, and we'll get paid off the balance. And that's when you receive your back end profit on the deal. So uh, in this type of scenario, you make money up front with a down payment, you make monthly cash flow, and you get a payoff on the back end. Now, of course, you could rent it out, you could lease option it, uh, you could sell it retail or even live in it yourself. You own a property when you buy it subject to, so you can really do whatever you want. Now, uh, so let's say you find a seller uh, who is open to subject to, Maybe they're getting a divorce, they've got a job transfer, whatever the case may be. He has a property that's got $150,000 mortgage on it with an interest rate of 4%, which is a little bit high for today, but let's just say it's 4%. Uh, let's say it's worth 170 and then you can sell it for 179 or so. Now, those are fairly common scenarios where the seller's equity would barely cover a realtor's fee and selling to you will give them a much faster, more certain outcome. Uh, you can find these deals out there all the time. The house is in good shape. It needs no repairs. Now, based on the interest rate on the seller's loan of 4%, uh, the equity spread you'll have between your buy and sell price is around $29,000, and you can create a cash flow uh, of about four fifty dollars a month. So in that case, you'd be looking to sell or finance. But, you know, let's look at all the other options. You know, as we talked about earlier, you can sell this deal with seller financing, find a buyer, uh, sell it for $179. Your buyer gives you $15,000 as a down payment. Your monthly payment on the seller's loan is $950. And your buyer's payment to you on the loan uh, that you make to him is $1,400. So there's your $450 a month in cash flow. Now, the interest rate on your seller's loan is 4%, and the rate you give your buyer is 7%. So when your buyer refinances you in a few years, uh, you'll get a payoff of around $20,000, and that will give you a total profit on the deal of over $50,000. So as you can see, a $50,000 profit, as I said earlier, on a relatively low equity deal is common. And that's why we love buying subject to and selling with seller financing. So uh, deal structure is really going to uh, matter when it comes to looking at the numbers. Uh, in the deal scenario, I told you uh, this, this last one, uh, we can take a relatively no equity deal, sell it with seller financing and make over 50 grand. Now you can take a, a deal that has equity, but has 
bad financing, maybe it's got a high interest rate loan, it won't cash flow for you or what have you, that would be a case where you would probably want to rent it out. Uh, excuse me, not rent it out, but, uh, but sell it with, uh, with a realtor type situation. Hey, Mark, glad you could join us. We're talking about uh, commonly asked questions about subject to and seller financing. So if you've got any questions, just give us uh, to those down here in the chat. We'll be glad to uh, take those and answer them for you. Okay, another question that I hear a lot uh, is what to do if the seller backs out of the deal. I'll tell you, um, the seller backing out of the deal, a lot of times we deal with people um, that are in distress. Um, you know, a question earlier was who would sell subject to? Well, a lot of times it's going to be people that are in trouble. Now, it doesn't have to be all the time. In fact, we had some my most profitable deal to date. Uh, probably was actually from a guy who just didn't want to deal with the house. Um, you know, he had, he had raised his kids in, in this one house. They had gotten very wealthy over time, bought a nice new home on the golf course, and that house was just a pay. And he said, I've been meaning to fix it up a little bit. It's, it's outdated. I have to go over there and cut the grass, and I'm just tired of fooling around with it. And I really just want to get rid of it. If I never have to go over there again, I'll be happy with that. And he, he gave us the deed to it and we took over the payments. Uh, so he wasn't in distress. He had plenty of money. But a lot of times people we deal with are under pressure. They're in foreclosure. They're getting a divorce. Um, you know, something's going on with them. Um, and, you know, it seems like, you know, the advice on Facebook and some other forums are to make sure you record a memorandum of agreement. Uh, try to force the seller to go ahead and sell to you if they've changed their mind. And, and I get it. You know, you ran edge, put out bandit signs, you make cold calls, you do all those things to get seller leads. You do whatever it is you do to attract leads and you got one. You signed up a deal. You were already thinking about the payday you're going to get and the cash flow. Uh, you get it signed up and then the seller calls and says, hey, we made a mistake. We want to cancel the deal. So what do you do? Well, for me, it's going to depend on a few things. Um, did you just sign it up a couple of days ago and you don't really have any time or money in it? Uh, maybe you've called a bank or you've put out a few signs to attract buyers or put up a couple of Facebook ads. Uh, maybe you put it on your website or you sent out an email to your buyers list, but you haven't really spent any money. You haven't ordered any inspections. You haven't gotten title done. You haven't done any of those things and had to come out of pocket. In those cases, I would first try to talk to the seller and see if the deal can be saved. You know, maybe somebody's talked to them and scared them or said, hey, those investors, they'll buy your house, they will make the payments, they'll wreck your credit, uh, you know, or you'll have some problems that way. You know, maybe he's spoken to somebody who told him that real estate investors are all scammers and he needs to get out of the contract. You know, maybe he has reservations about being on the loan for a long period of time and, and that's what's keeping him up at night or disturbed. Uh, but hey, maybe his aunt Sally has volunteered to help him with the back payments if he's in foreclosure and is actually going to help him keep his house. And, and he really wants to do that. You know, maybe he just changed his mind. Maybe the job he had in another town's fallen through. You just don't know until you talk to the seller what's really going on. Uh, regardless of the reason, uh, it, whether it was any of the things I just mentioned, or maybe he just decided he doesn't like you, doesn't want to sell to you. Uh, no matter what the reason, in most cases, my advice is just to let it go. Um, you know, uh, we have to partner in, in a sense with our sellers. You know, we're almost, until we pay off that loan, we're almost partners. They could pop back up at any time, have a bunch of questions about what's going on. When are you going to get this thing paid off? It could be hard to deal with them. You don't want to have to deal with a hostile person in an ongoing basis. I mean, sure you know. So, Remember, helping people is really a big part of what we do, and most of us put that out there uh, as part of what we do. So do you think you're really helping someone if you try to force them to do something that they don't want to do, or maybe they're even scared to do? 
Um, if you've got a little more time in this thing, and maybe even you've done some title work, you've done some things, some inspections that have cost you some money, even in those cases, you know, the best thing to do is just wish the seller well, let them off the hook, and just remind them that if things don't work out, whatever's happened, whatever's made them change their mind, you'd still like at some point in the future to talk to them. If they still need to sell the house, you'd still like to help them out. Um, and, and that's generally how we do things. Uh, you should have enough leads in your pipeline to where one deal falling through isn't the end of the world for you. You need to be constantly marketing anyway. Now, if you know it turns out the seller just decided he doesn't want to do the deal or he's somebody else offered him a couple of thousand dollars more and he's really nasty with you, what do you do? Well, and my advice would be to let it go anyway, but you do have some other options. Uh, if you have a strong contract and you have the right clauses in there, uh, you can sue for specific performance if that's what you want to do. I don't recommend it, but it is an option for you. Uh, you can record a memorandum of agreement at the courthouse. So uh, if this guy tries to sell the house to someone else, uh, that may cloud the title enough to where the title company uh, won't, uh, won't let him make the sale without paying you what your expected profit was. You can certainly do that. Um, so you do have options. Again, my recommendation uh, in most cases is just to let it go because you can be working on something else and, uh, and make a lot more money, not, not dealing with all of that negativity and everything else. So anyway, uh, if you guys got any questions, just let us have those down here and, uh, Hey, Jonathan. Jonathan's on the call today. Good to see you. Uh, we're talking about uh, frequently asked questions about subject two today. You know, how does subject two work? We run into uh, a lot of new students who are wholesalers and are just tired of the grind of having to constantly market for deals. And, uh, you know, I mean, if they take off for a month on vacation or something like that, uh, then the money stops, stops coming in. So, uh, they're interested in sub two and how it works. Uh, so we get a lot of questions about those things. Um, you know, with subject two, you can buy as many houses as you want. If you follow our model and you sell them with seller financing, then, um, you know, then you're going to create cash flow. And I actually teach a session that we're probably going to talk about next month on how to buy just 12 houses a month and create a cash flow of over half a million dollars a year in 36 months. So you don't have to go out and try to buy 10 or 15 houses a month. You can actually just do that um, one house a month. So who can't do that? Uh, do you guys work a full-time job? I know when I got started, I worked a full-time job that had me uh, on, you know, working 60, 70 hours a week. And I was still able to, uh, to manage buying, you know, a couple of houses a month for the first year. So it can absolutely be done. So any questions, just uh, just let us have those down here. Uh, anything else you'd like to talk about? We've got a few resources for you guys. I'm going to share those with you here real quick. Uh, some freebies that may help you uh, with your business. Uh, you can visit our website at sub2deals.com. We've got a ton of articles uh, and uh, tools and resources for you there. Sub2coolstuff.com is uh, our website you can go to and download uh, 15 different tools to help you in your Sub2 business, anything from business plans to negotiation courses, amortization schedules, 90-day uh, action plan to uh, get your uh, business jump started, uh, all those things. You can get that absolutely free. Just go to sub2coolstuff.com. Uh, Sub2 Forum, that's our Facebook group. We've got over 6,000 members now, and we talk about Sub2 all day, every day. So you can jump in there, ask, uh, ask your questions, and get those answered every day. If you're not a subscriber uh, or listener, we have a podcast, a weekly podcast. It's, you can go to sub2podcast.com and uh, uh, get notifications on that when we release those. And we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, where we release uh, our podcast uh, and uh, goat talk segments and also give out real estate investing tips. So get over there, subscribe to that, and we'll be glad to help you. Uh, got a few more minutes here. Any other questions or anything uh, from you guys about subject two or creative finance, seller finance, that sort of thing? 
Okay. Well, if we don't have any other questions today, I guess we'll wrap it up here. Appreciate all of you guys taking the time to come out and listen. If you have any questions about creative finance or subject tours, any way I can help you, you can always contact me in the Sub2 forum uh, or email me at william at sub2deals.com. Anything you would like to see on these uh, segments at REI USA, uh, any certain topics you would like to have covered, send those to me. And I'll be glad to do that and put together a presentation for you. Hope you guys are having a great day talking to some sellers, uh, buying some houses, and uh, we'll see you next time. Y'all have a great day.